Hello and welcome to lesson number five. So in this lesson we will continue a little bit from where we la left on the last lesson. So the last lesson was a more extensive session. We talked a lot about, um, about performance art and some association, associated uh, manifestations. Some of the performance art uh, pieces we discussed in the last lesson had also some connections to time-based art and also to installations. So you can also see performance art as a very hybrid field where many uh, media are often uh, involved, not just in the documentation, but also in the creation process uh, itself. So in terms of time, the time span we were talking about in the lesson before, we started around the 50s and we went uh, all through the 60s, 70s, and almost to the 80s. So today we will go a little bit back in time again, and we will start. Uh, we will start again in the late uh, 50s with um, pop art. We won't go through pop art too too extensively. So we will talk about uh, influences uh, of of pop art. And then we will move on to um, other movements, uh, for example, art povera, conceptual art, post-minimalism, and we will end with uh, land art. So this is the uh, plan, uh, the plan for for today. And uh, I would also like to invite you to pay attention to the topics discussed because this is also important for your Aufgabe. Uh, a lot of these uh, movements we will talk about today, they worked with uh, installation and they worked also often with performance. So in the context of your Aufgabe with this topic of the still life, it is important that you are aware that most of these movements, like for example art povera and conceptual art and especially um, minimalism and post-minimalism also, but especially land art, uh, they worked with topics which are in very close affiliation to the topic of the of the still life, but they worked on a large scale spaces, so through installations and even often, such as in the case of land art, outside directly in the landscape, so with natural elements and in the landscape. Um, and since you work for your Aufgabe also in these different scales, so you start with the scale of the object to the scale of the room to the scale of the city and interaction with, with your own body and other bodies and changing the, the scale and the context of these objects to see how the, how the change of context changes the meaning and the perception we can have of, of the objects and especially in the creation of, of uh, narratives. So this is an introduction to give you a little bit of an idea of, of how the lecture will develop. So I would ask you to open the file which was uploaded on, on Moodle, Moodle. So we start talking about uh, pop art. So probably you have a little bit of an awareness already of what uh, pop art was in terms of uh, an artistic uh, movement. This movement was developed simultaneously in various uh, in various cities, uh, but it has a lot to do with uh, post World War II American consumer commodity boom, and so art pop really picks up this vocabulary of um, advertising of consumer culture and takes advantage of this to create a blend between high art and, and consumer consumer art. So it picks up this aesthetic of advertising and also of comics to create an art which is uh, easily reproduced, also easily uh, sold, massively, eventually massively produced, uh, sometimes picking up also the logic of, of factories, so also Pop art also um, reinterpreted uh, methods of production in art, for example, in the work of Andy Warhol, who had a rather large uh, studio for production, which was called the Factory. And the Factory produced artwork with uh, all sorts of media, so many, many different uh, media. Andy Warhol was very 
interested in exploring every possible media in his work. So he worked with, with painting, with reproduction, with photography, with film, printing, te printing techniques. So he was not restricted by the medium, but he was also very interested in the process of production itself. Um, and in terms of, uh, of aesthetic, of course, there was also this uh, very strong uh, idea of appropriation of the icons and of the images of everyday life. So in this case, the work of Andy Warhol really has strong significance, especially in the context of the still life, for he brought to, to attention, and you can see from the collection of uh, images uh, I selected for you, he brought to attention the aesthetic value, uh, again the aesthetic value, of these objects of everyday life. So we have the iconic uh, Campbell's, Campbell's beef noodle soup, uh, and how in a very subversive way it was possible to bring into high art things which were considered low, but at the same time were objects in everyday life that had a very strong aesthetic uh, component. They were made to be as appealing and as beautiful as possible because it was very important that they would be sold. So Andy Warhol really wanted to at the same time make this visible, but also uh, at the same time pick up these uh, items from everyday life and um, bring them to uh, to a sublime, even iconic, almost religious uh, dimension. Uh, Andy Warhol was very interested in the topic of of the of the still life, also since he developed also quite a considerable uh, amount of time dedicating to the topic of vanitas. So as as you learned. The, the, very important in the context of, of the still life. So we have, you have on page five, you have an example of a vanitas with a skull. There's also a very interesting series by Andy Warhol. You don't have any of the slides, but it's also dedicated to these morbid, mor morbid uh, aspects. There's a series dedicated to the electric chair, uh, pho photographs of the electric chair. And also, uh, Another, uh, another series dedicated to the topic of car accidents, of car crashes. Uh, and these were things that Andy Warhol was fascinated by. He, he was fascinated by the life uh, itself, but also by the, um, by the presence uh, of death in everyday life. So he produced quite a, quite a number of uh, still lives in which we can always see, even in the strong contrast and strong uh, colors and the playfulness that reminds us of the aesthetic of advertising. There is always a tone of um, morbidity and there's always a tone of uh, an awareness of the passage of time. Uh, so we have here on the slides a selection, a selection of uh, of work by Andy Warhol. We have here also a portrait, a portrait with a skull, something which is between a skull and a monkey. And in this case, it's a self-portrait, but it's also, um, but it's also a reflection or Andy Warhol's reflection on his own mortality. And um, of course, we can see that uh, the way Andy Warhol worked, specifically with this hybrid hybrid technique between painting and printing, so the ability also to produce, mass produce uh, artworks. This was also something that was, that was in, in some ways new, the way he approached it, although already um, Albrecht Dürer, when, when he uh, in, was involved in, in the printing process, was aware of the possibility of, of uh, reproducing art quickly and being able to, to sell the work and to distribute the works through these prints to, to a larger number of people. So in some ways Andy Warhol was very original but he was also picking up, picking up um, older ideas and, uh, and traditions and we definitely see this in many of the, of the motives that he uses in his work. So there is a very strong dedication to uh, iconography, so this iconography instead of being um, directly 
depicting religious motives or or uh, myths or narratives pick up the the motives and the myths and the narratives of consumer culture and of Andy Warhol's biggest uh, obsession celebrity culture so picking up these icons from celebrity culture and bringing them to this uh, status of, of, of elevation of, of icon so we have here a collection of, of Andy Warhol's uh, Polaroids so these are still lives that he developed already later uh, in his career so from the late 70s to the 80s this is, this is a series he was experimenting with uh, Polaroid as a, as a format and he did these quick Polaroids with uh, specific um, clusters and a selection of objects knives, uh, perfume bottles, women's shoes, office materials the Brillo boxes, which were of course an icon that he that he used in painting and also in sculpture, in installation, the Coca-Cola can, the beer can, uh, toys, but also more traditional still life uh, motifs, vet vegetables next to tomatoes, next to noodles. Of course, the tomato is probably still a reference to the uh, tomato soup. So again picking up a self-referential universe to his own to his own arc, art and to his own iconography um, and again some other uh, explorations also the bananas of course shoes eggs prosthetics guns lobsters the lobster is probably a reference to um, to surrealism and the work of Salvador Dali. Uh, and on page 17 we have we have here from page 17 on a uh, selection of artworks from Roy Lichtenstein who was also interested in who was also one of the most important figures in, in American uh, pop art and Lichtenstein uh, was very interested in the aesthetic of uh, comics not so much from advertising although we can see that the use of color could remind a little bit of advertising but the direct reference is really the aesthetic of uh, comments of comics so uh, using this way of, of um, representing form but also representing uh, the way color is used and uh, using these uh, dots to, to mark surfaces and to mark shades, so very similar uh, or in reference to, to the aesthetic of comics and again using uh, very typical of pop art uh, playful uh, use of something of, of an aesthetic which is from a minor object or object of minor uh, uh, supposedly minor aesthetic values such as the the comics and elevating it to the status to the status of art so paintings which use the same techniques as comics which until then were considered lower and, and definitely not an art form so in a way to elevate uh, to elevate it and to, to transform it not just as an illustration which was also often considered inferior in terms of artistic representation so not just an illustration but also as a um, representational technique in uh, painting so we have here some examples of still lives where we see actually the choice of objects and uh, the composition in this case of Liechtenstein is rather classical although we could see some uh, affinities in terms of the choice of objects with some of the cubist um, still life so there is definitely some resemblances to, to cubism but also to classical, classical still life uh, in general and we also have uh, Vanitas on page 19 uh, still life with a cow's uh, skull and on page 20 we definitely have uh, a still life by Roy Lichtenstein which is a direct reference to, to cubism where we have uh, we have interestingly enough we have roses and we have uh, a watch and these are 
traditional uh, mountains, as you learn of, of, uh, in the case of the still life. So we have this reference to time, to the passage of time. But picking up how this was interpreted by the Cubists, we have a representation which shows us time as something fragmented. So this fragmentation of time. And this is an uh, interesting, uh, interesting interpretation from uh, Liechtenstein, which picks up this idea of fragmentation, in, which was in the beginning of the of the of the 20th century, so as it was uh, proposed with Cubism, and reinterprets it in 1975, which was also a time of very strong social and political changes and revolutions. So probably this um, representation also has something to do. With a feeling of a new, of a new avant-garde and of, of a new fragmentation of time, uh, and we have also some examples from uh, Richard Hamilton. In this case, not with painting, uh, but with uh, photography and with the use of everyday objects, uh, so objects of daily life. In this case, uh, Hamilton was very interested in. Um, daily uh, con con machines so for example here we have we have a brown uh, uh, microwave so in the still life on page uh, 21 and later we will have a toaster and the toaster is even called Hamilton and this is also a kind of a wink from the artist to the brand uh, and Hamilton really proposes already this idea that the artist the name of the artist can be used as something like a brand and can be used as a brand for this kind of appliances. So uh, also a very subversive idea of how an appliance can be sold with a name and, uh, and how the name of the artist can also be somehow connected to, to, to the name and the function or the symbol of what an appliance can um, represent. And we also have from Hamilton, page 22 and 23, some uh, collages. Uh, so this is picking up the tradition that started with Dada. So you remember in the beginning of the 20th century. Also two lessons ago, we talked, we spoke about uh, Rauschenberg and we spoke about Neo Dada and how collage was being um, reintroduced. Also in the last lesson, when we spoke about the situationists, the situation is, as you saw from the work of uh, Constant, for example, they were very interested in collage uh, as a medium. And uh, Richard Hamilton also worked with collage, which often was considered not such a serious uh, art uh, medium. So he also picked it up again to create these uh, interesting uh, collages. For example, in page 22, we have an interior and we have this uh, situation created with an interior and uh, female figure that looks a little bit like a housewife and there's a TV. So we have a kind of idea of an atmosphere that's uh, happening, happening here, but we also have these bold, strong colors. So there is a very strong, in the image, a very strong opposition, uh, an idea of some things being forcefully put together in, in context. And there's also a certain idea of, uh, of a forced optimism in, in an environment which can actually be uh, oppressive. We have, we have something that looks like a, like a very traditional bourgeois interior in black and white and subdued colors. We have some strong um, geometric, geometric shapes that kind of give give a very strong idea of structure to the space and then we have these bold colors making making things forcefully making somehow trying to make things beautiful and we can interpret this uh, as uh, Richard Hamilton's statement on the forced optimism of the post post world war 2 which was uh, which was an, uh, a sort of optimism of denial, of, of not really dealing with with what had happened with the war, and uh, of a very accelerated uh, need and pressure to to rebuild and to keep up and to make a home and be baby boomers and consume and uh, 
and uh, fit to a certain uh, societal normative uh, expectation. So in this very interesting collage, we see, we see the female figure, we see the woman in the middle, kind of cornered in the middle of, of a room, trying to make sense uh, of, of her surroundings and basically not having much space, not, not, not much space to move. So it's a very claustrophobic uh, image. Uh, we also have on page uh, 23, we have uh, another collage from uh, Richard Hamilton. In this case, uh, it's a reference to the universe of fashion, which can also be seen as a still life, as it has, uh, it's a very interesting mix between uh, photography uh, or, or fragments from, from photography overlaid in the fo uh, photo of, um, of a light stand. Uh, so it's an interesting it's an interesting situation that shows us uh, that transports us immediately to this uh, universe of, of the fashion shoot. But also uh, in terms of, of these ideas of, of fashion and how things can somehow be, be put together, uh, we can also speculate uh, when looking at the fragments fragments of the picture we see these, we see a female figure which is constituted by parts and we can also make, uh, make a reference to in the context of consumer culture and how often, uh, especially the, the female figure, is, uh, is represented and exposed in parts in order to sell products which have the goal of addressing specific bodily faults or to highlight one, sp one specific item. So this idea of, of the female body and of the female figure not as a unified whole, whole but as a, as, as a collection, forced collection of, of uh, fragments. So ultimately uh, an object. We spoke about the toaster already and on page 25 we have uh, we have another piece. I apologize, I don't have the correct name here and I don't remember at the moment, but this is an uh, assemblage where we have put together in a very subversive way uh, these two items of everyday life <laughs> in a way that they are not really supposed to interact together. So we have the prosthetic teeth, which is always something that we react with some kind of uh, discomfort. Uh, so we have this extremely visible prosthetic teeth and we have the electric toothbrush attached to the prosthetic teeth. And we have here an interesting paradox because as you probably all know, uh, the myth and the invention around the, elect the electric toothbrush is that it will wash your, uh, clean your teeth really, really well and eventually preventing you from having uh, dental problems that might lead you to need to use some kind of dental uh, prosthetics. So we have here this item which uh, fights, fights against the need for having fake, uh, fake teeth. So it's punctured into the prosthetic and we have, we have this kind of uh, new created uh, object which, uh, which we can uh, transport many many interesting um, associations to. Also because if we if we detach from the meaning of these objects and if we see the object in itself um, and if we analyze the shape and so the object also can have a kind of phallic, uh, phallic uh, appearance. So there's definitely many uh, associations and many uh, in, uh, plays and, and interesting things that, that come from this subversive act of, of putting these two objects together and, and taken out of context. Also as an example of how a still life can be created with objects of their, their, their daily life put into a different context, doing something they are not supposed to be doing in order to create another narrative or different, different possible narratives. Uh, so now we stop. We stop with pop art. Although we could we could talk extensively, obviously, about each one of these movements, 
But the goal of these lectures is uh, we don't have time and we also don't have the possibility to do it. Uh, but the goal of the lectures is really more to give you a basic overview of, of the tendencies and of what each of these movements was uh, roughly uh, trying, trying to address and also so that you can understand the continuity and the development between each of them. So again, now I say, we did not really have a jump between pop art and then the next movement, which we will talk about, which is Arte Povera. No, that's not what happened. As you remember from the lesson before, we had pop art, yes, and then we had all these developments that happened until performance art. So we had Gutai and we had Fluxus and we had happenings and we had all these things that were, ha that were happening. <laughs> And uh, all these artistic manifestations were influenced by social transformations, reaction to the conditions of World War II, but most of all, very strong reactions to these ideas of uh, consumer culture and also of how marketing and advertising in some contexts uh, were were trying to... Um, to surpass this idea of, of producing art, which is market driven. So already with the happenings and fluxus and so, we saw many artistic manifestations and the ones we are going to talk about now, from now on, that will try to boycott this tendency to work artistically in a market driven way. So we have these two poles. We could see that in uh, pop art, the artists were still were actually interested in using the logic of market to support their work and to sell. And of course, as a reaction, we saw other manifestations that on purpose did not want to use this uh, approach. So one group that really did not want to work in this way and in fact wanted to make a common stance against a market-driven art world, and uh, and bringing again the bringing back the importance of uh, personal expression, so that the artist would have uh, the creative freedom to to express his own uh, artistic uh, intentions and and position. A movement called Arte Povera appeared uh, in Italy. And this was an artist collective that really made a radical stance against uh, what what were the established laws of uh, uh, what was considered artistic taste or what could be used uh, in art. And they wanted to create an art which was at the same time free from con conventions, but at the same time free from... Um, from attachment to consumer culture and, and so they wanted to work with materials that were um, considered poor. So the word povera in Italian means, uh, means uh, poor. And, and so the idea, also uh, these Italian artists who worked with uh, art povera, they were interested in preserving some uh, characteristics that were typical of Italian culture, because they already felt that this kind of market-driven market uh, artistic production was being too influenced by an imperialistic attitude and by American uh, influences. So they wanted to pre preserve uh, techniques and um, ideas and even myths that were connected to their own culture and that they were also connected to um, to everyday life. So in the case of uh, Arte Povera and in, in, in the context of, of the still life, Arte Povera really picked up as, as a medium and also as objects of representation, but most of all because Arte Povera worked a lot with uh, sculpture and with uh, installation, it was really important to use these objects taken out of, uh, taken from, out from their original context and transforming them into, into the artwork uh, itself. 
So as examples, we had the work of Alghero Boetti and Michelangelo Pistoletto, which uh, besides Art Pobre came to be um, an artist uh, with, with a name uh, by, by himself. So the, the artists from uh, Art Pobre, in the beginning they worked as a, as a collective and uh, their work was uh, curated and presented and organized by the curator Germano Celand, who was really important uh, in terms of, of assembling the, the work and the tendencies of these artists who were first working more or less independently and for uh, writing and, and explaining in a more unified way what, what these artists collectively were trying to do. Uh, at some point the collective uh, dissolved and uh, the artists wanted to, to work more independently and establish themselves um, themselves also in the art market and eventually selling their work and not not being restricted by the um, by the ideas of, of the art of opera so so it also developed in this way but when they were working together they really had this kind of common purpose which was to pick up the focus again on, on the simple objects of their, their life and reinterpret it and of course this was an avant-garde uh, attitude and it also had a political uh, political agenda so one quote by uh, Germano Celan that you have on page 29 explained very well what uh, what artists of, of the art povera tried to do the difficulty of knowledge or of taking possession of things is enormous. Conditioning prevents us from seeing a pavement, a corner or a daily space. And Fabro, one of the artists, reproposes the rediscovery of a pavement, a corner or the axis that unites the floor and the ceiling of a room. He is not worried about satisfying the system and intends, intends instead to disembowel it. So with this quote, we can really understand what Art Povera was trying to do. It was it was really had this very specific um, purpose or this very specific intention of looking at these poor objects from daily life, understand their value, or understand that society regards regards them as worthless and show that through transformation and changing of uh, context that these worthless uh, objects can become uh, work of art, so in many ways can become uh, priceless. On page 27 we have what we could say a proto or, or a precursor of the art of over uh, attitude, which was of course a provocative statement by Piero Manzoni and it's called uh, Merte d'Artista, so artist ship. And allegedly, this is of course a reference to, to Marcel Duchamp also. Um, Manzoni's father had a, had a canned, uh, canned goods uh, factory and allegedly uh, the, artist, the artist created this story that uh, allegedly his own excrement uh, would have been uh, canned and, and sealed and, and pro 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 processed in this way and sold. And of course, this is a critique to to the to the art market uh, that everything from the artist can be sold, can be put to the level of of art, but also of of this uh, idea of how um, of how a story can sell something, also, and of in how far people can believe the story or not, and how far people's curiosity could actually go, because people. Nobody knows if actually there was, in fact, excrement inside of the cans because to be able to know if there was or not, one would have to open the can, which would mean damaging the artwork and destroying its potential commercial value or the value of the artistic piece and the integrity of the piece itself. So, of course, it's, it's a joke and it's a provocation, but it's also an intelligent, an intelligent statement. Uh, another artist who was, in a way, one, one of the precursors or one of the proto art of artists was Lucio Fontana, who was working with painting until he arrived at his own artistic position when he invented um, 
um, special uh, painting or concerto spaziale and this was a very minimalistic gesture which consisted simply of painting the canvas and slitting the canvas open as, as, as a painting gesture. And this means that the canvas is broken, that uh, a painting can become a spatial uh, concept with uh, sculptural uh, qualities, but at the same time it is also already a gesture towards minimalism, but also reminding us of, of the work of Pollock, of, of, of Jackson Pollock, of using this kind of impulse and this kind of more, uh, we could say, destructive, destructive gesture and incorporating it in the act of, of the artwork. We have, in the case of Art Povera, also here some uh, artwork from Marise Mertz, one of the female artists who was involved with the Art Povera uh, movement. And we have here a piece which uh, integrates uh, hair, horse hair, with, um, with, uh, with a wire. And we have another example on page uh, 30, and we have here uh, untitled uh, Living Sculpture. Uh, and we see that uh, in the work of uh, Marisa Mers, we have this kind of very informal way of, of, dealing, with, uh, of dealing with the shape and dealing with, with, how, with how form develops. But we also have an unusual use of uh, material and also how the material is presented uh, in space. So they're called living sculptures exactly because they have this informal character and way of, of uh, development uh, and also because they remind us of organic processes and or organic forms. And this is a piece from 1966. On page 31 we have an example from Michelangelo uh, Pistoletto, the Venus of the Rex, from 1967 and we have here a reproduction of, of uh, Venus which is uh, installed uh, on site and this piece has been re recreated uh, many times but uh, there is a specific set of instructions which uh, requires that the the amount of, of, of rags, and these are pieces, pieces of, of uh, clothing, that they should be assembled in a way that, uh, that reinforces its multicolor uh, character and that it piles them together in this kind of pyramidal, pyramidal uh, shape. So these are, these are the, the rules, although of course with uh, all different installations the, 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 this sculpture element will look will look differently um, and of course we can make many associations when we see uh, Venus of, of the rags of course we we know that this is also a critique to consumer consumer culture we see a female figure managing uh, managing huge loads of, of clothing that probably nobody would would really need um, and we have many associations of uh, roles of women uh, in a domestic environment, uh, as mothers, as uh, housekeepers, but we also see, we can make associations of, of women who are being somehow influenced by consumer culture to acquire more and more and more uh, rags. So the piece, the piece is also uh, provocative and it also acquires a very, a very strong, uh, timeless, timeless quality. At the same time, and in, this is the reason why, uh, why the piece is, although it doesn't look so much on, on first sight, as, as we, especially if we compare with the other works of Art Povera we see, we saw before, uh, that we look at these rags and we could say, uh, well, but they are bright and they are colorful and art popera normally works with um, waste materials and so, but these colorful 
colorful objects are waste material, so they, they were uh, thrown away, thrown away rags. So not really clothing that one would use anymore. They they are being uh, recycled actually to to make the work. So the idea is really that uh, it would be also be possible to make an artwork that picks up this waste material, uh, these rags, these colorful rags that are out of season and out of style, and uh, reinterpret it to make the work. And we have another example on page 32 of Maritza Mertz, another living sculpture, in this case with the use of color. And on page 33 we have uh, Giulio Paolini's Amore is Seeking, and we have um, also the use of, of rags in this kind of rainbow, a very interesting installation um, which, which fuses uh, drawing and painting in this idea of the frame, which is repeated multiple times, so giving the viewer an idea to, f to frame different parts of the, of the artwork and look at different aspects of, of the artwork which are framed until we arrive uh, at, the, at the center focus of what could, what could be the piece. And, um, and this is a reference, of course, to the, to the myths of uh, Amor de Psyche, although we don't really see, see the female figure from the front, we see her on, only from the back. So, of course, this is a piece that also has a lot to do with the idea of, of desire. Another example from uh, Art from Arte Povera, uh, we have here, we will have a few igloos from Mario Merz, who was more interested in working with this archetypal idea of, of the igloo and explored this uh, archetype with different with different uh, materials. So we have an igloo made uh, of, of metal and then we have another characteristic that was interesting, uh, uh, that interested the artists from Arte Povero was they were not interested in working only with natural materials, although they were interested in simple materials and discarded materials. Working with natural materials was more something that would come come up later with land art. In the case of Arte Povera, these Italian artists were also interested in showing through the work the direct contrast between the natural and the artificial and the handmade and the industrially produced. So in this case of the igloo of the igloos, we have some igloos which are made of natural materials, others are made of metal, although with uh, pro processed through uh, machines or through eventually even uh, handmade uh, handmade uh, techniques uh, and also the incorporation of neon so we have we have these strong contrasts between the man-made and the machine made but at the same time working with something which is very um, which is a reference almost to, to, to a kind of archaic narrative. So the igloo, a primitive uh, archetype of, of a shelter. So taking us back to, to um, also to think about living, living in, a, in a tribe or other stages, stages of development and also in a way making an allusion to, to the human body and to the idea of need of, of shelter. We also have on page 35 an example from uh, Stone Eagle. And on page uh, 36 we have another eagle which integrates a uh, neon and uh, completely made. So the, this, this one is, is more assumedly definitely a, a sculpture but also an installation uh, made with bags of sand. On page 37 we have by Pino Pascali, we have uh, a group uh, of, of um, agricultural instruments. So in this case we definitely see that uh, the artist was trying to, uh, and this is a still life of course, it's, it's an installation and it's a still life, which brings together these uh, traditional uh, instruments and these traditional materials which are associated with an idea uh, 
with this also archetypal idea of uh, agriculture and bringing them into the context of, of installation and specifically installing them in, um, in a gallery. So this was also a completely new um, gesture. Uh, some uh, artists of uh, Arte Povera were also interested in not using um, as, as a medium not just installation, although installation and sculpture were the most uh, important, but also working with performance art. So as an example, you have on page 38 the work by Giuseppe Pinoni, Robicciari Propiocchi, Reversing One's Eyes. And this is a very interesting piece, in, uh, which is also minimalistic in many ways, and of course relies on the documentation, it relies on the photography, that we have the artist wearing mirroring contact lenses, so he has kind of mirror uh, in his eyes, uh, to show this idea of reversed sight. So, on first appearance, we see a figure that could look like a blind person, or it could look also a little bit like, like an animal sometimes, when one meets, a, for example, a dog or a wolf in a forest, one can see the eyes have this kind of stra strange uh, reflection. So, of course, first we have, we have an, an uncomfortable encounter with this, um, with this, uh, impact of, of seeing these eyes that don't communicate as we are normally used to, so they have a reversed way of communication. So they are, they are mirroring, mirroring what, what, what we see, and we can of course see ourselves in those eyes, but the name of the piece of reversing one's eyes also makes an allusion to, to the idea of blindness, and to the idea of being able not to see from the from the inside out, or, or from the out within, but but to be able to see from the self within. So this idea of, of seeing perhaps not through the eyes, but seeing through another way of seeing or another way of sensing. So this idea of reversed sight, which of course has metaphysical, metaphysical and phenomenological um, implications. Another piece by Giuseppe Pennoni also related to performance art, in this case a mix of performance art and drawing, uh, to unroll one's skin. And this is a mix of uh, photography and of uh, body print, so a print of, one, of the artist's own body directly in the canvas. Uh, or, or in the in the paper or the support where, where the photo is and we have this blend between the two different modes of representation of the body we have the photography which shows the more perhaps the more direct the more um, visible uh, aspects of, of, of the body and then we have the print which is the trace that the body leaves but also at the same time with the fingerprints uh, what could be the subjective and the personal and, and the individual put together. We have also here an example, later example, but still in the context of Arte Povera, and this already also in a little bit connection of what later would be uh, land art. By uh, This is a work by Giuseppe Pennoni on page 40, Alpi Maritini. Uh, Mar maritime Alps, it will continue to grow except at that point. And so, and th this was a project which was um, planted, so, so in a forest with, with a tree and a sculptural element in the shape of a hand that pinches this tree and, cre and creates a permanent restriction so that the tree continues to grow, but it will, as, as long as this cultural element is there, it will grow around it, so it's it's a permanent um, condition for this uh, for this uh, tree tree to grow. And of course, this is a commentary on uh, human intervention in the environment. So it's a piece that also has uh, environmentalist um, preoccupations. And now we arrive at uh, minimalism. 
So just to give you an idea of time, we can say that um, minimalism also started around the 70s. So as you remember from the last lecture when we spoke about the work of, uh, for example, of Yoko Ono, who was very involved with performance art, but also with other artistic movements, minimalism, and also conceptual art, which I will talk about uh, afterwards. Um, but minimalism, we are still talking about late 60s, beginning of the 70s also. But with Art Povera, we were talking about Europe and we were talking about uh, Italy. And with minimalism, we are talking about uh, United States. So we are talking about uh, what, what we define or what has been defined historically as, as uh, minimalism as an artistic uh, movement or an artistic tendency refers to the work of a group of New York-based artists that wanted to question the boundaries between multiple media to express the basic materiality of art objects. So minimalists were not, although Yoko Ono, for example, had, has definitely some minimalist components in her work, minimalist artists, they were very interested in the objects. Um, they were uh, very interested in, uh, in approaching art, especially uh, in, in terms of sculpture, and they wanted to work with anonymous industrial manufacturing and austere forms. So they were very interested in, um, in uh, remake the conventions of sculpture, the, the, the conventions also of, of narrative in sculpture, so they really wanted to create uh, artworks which were often untitled, so they were stripped of, of narrative content, and uh, that also somehow could liberate the artistic uh, object of, of the burden of appearance. So through their uh, minimalism, they would express the, the materiality and the purity of, of of the art, art object itself or the properties of the material. And this often happened uh, through a mix of sculpture and installation. So often what we see is a lot of care given to the, to the haptic uh, appearance of, of the material, but also the situation in relationship to the space really has an important, uh, really important uh, character. So some of the most important artists who worked uh, within minimalism were Donald Judd, Robert Morris and Carlo Andre. So especially in the work of Donald Judd, we see that the objects really expose the qualities of the space where they are uh, installed in. And we have on page 43 and 44 two pieces by Carl Andre. Uh, we see that, you can see that in minimalism, uh, of course, there were different tendencies. So, for example, Donald Judd was very interested in working with uh, metal and uh, also exploring strong, bold colors and strong uh, contrasts. And in the case of uh, Carl Andre, Carl Andre worked more with timber, so he was interested in, in wood and solid blocks of wood and how how this could be, uh, these could be put together, and this kind of modularity was also something that was uh, important in terms of uh, minimalism. We also have here another piece by Carl Andre, a uh, later piece, so the piece from the 70s really are more focused on wood, and the later work um, explores the use of other materials, so specifically in this case we have here on page 45 we have some explorations of um, with uh, concrete, with the use of concrete as a sculptural uh, material, but we are again, we see here again um, that he was working still with this idea of, of modular components and um, and working with the blocks as uh, and these minimalist blocks as sculptural elements. Um, 
Another example that we can say from uh, minimalism, uh, although this is a very specific case, in the case of uh, minimalism it's a really fun uh, example of, of how an artist could incorporate the tendencies of uh, minimalism with performance art. And so Robert Morris, he had an installation at the Tate Gallery in 1971 called Body Space Motion Things, which was completely site-specific, so it was, it was made for the, for the Tate. Um, and it installed a series of installations to be used by the visitors, so there were performance, uh, performance pieces, but also installation or, or sculptural elements. And they were meant to make people play with spatial situations. So as you see here on page uh, 46, 46, we see that there was... And these uh, installations were done with very simple archetype, also archetypal uh, elements. So we have, we have a, a concrete um, a cylinder that can be used to roll with the whole, with the whole body. On page 47 you see other different spatial situations such as a ramp with ropes or uh, a log of wood. On page 48 we see that there is this, uh, a very high sloped ramp with a pole and a ceiling which can be put up and down with, with the motion of the body or has to be otherwise the ceiling would fall and would uh, crash. And, and we have another one with, uh, with a ramp and a rope and how, how the body can use it to, to climb and to be suspended and in different ways. And um, it was an interest, it's, uh, there's many interesting records from this uh, installation at the time because of course people loved it and found it very playful and so, but it was also a very bold move to install this in a gallery because some people got so carried away while using the installation that they damaged some of the installation or even got hurt because the materials were very precarious so in, in some way also a little bit popular, although not really popular but the materials were, were kind of fragile and so and the whole thing was very provisional and, uh, and there are some interesting uh, records from the time that, that register some complaints and also from from uh, from the gallery a little bit of discomfort with uh, with the situation but it was really a pioneer work and it was recreated uh, recreated by by Tate also recently um, another artist that started with this uh, minimalist minimalist uh, tendency although he did develop uh, to, to create his own signature signature work as an artist was uh, Richard Serra, uh, who later became known by his uh, really large scale um, metal metal uh, sculptures, which are installed, for example, in the Guggenheim and so on. Um, and we have here on page forty nine one of his uh, earlier works, which is called One Tone Prop. House of Cards, and we have here this very simple uh, uh, assembly of, of, of a few elements to create to create a sculpture. And the way uh, Richard Serra described his work, his previous work in the early '60s, which was really important because it set the foundations of what would be later his later artistic work and also his artistic identity and, and way, way of working. So as we have here on page 50, we have a quote by Sena that he explains how he got to these ideas and his work uh, process. When I was working in the early 60s, I wanted to reduce things to pure process and activity. So I wrote down a list of verbs to lift, to, to curl, to roll, to bend, to tie, to curve, to inlay, to splash. There are probably over 60 or 70 of them. And I decided to work those verbs in relationship to material in place and time. In this case, the verb was to lift. And I found that if I just lifted this piece of vulcanized rubber up from its center, it would freestand. stand. 
Not only it would freestand, but its surface would be almost topologically continuous. That means there would be no inside or outside if you continued following the form. And I thought, isn't this curious? All I've done is follow the action of the verb, lifted the thing up, and I have what I consider to be a sculptural form. So Richard Serra really understood that uh, this, uh, and in this way it's also close to what would be conceptual art, uh, this idea of analyzing how the verb of, of the, of the, or, the, or the suggestion of, the, of an action can give a hint to an artistic process, and in this case an artistic process of working with the material and translating this artistic process into action, which sequentially or, or logically is transformed into form, and in this case into sculptural form. And on page 51 we have here an example of the verb list by uh, Richard Serra, which can also be seen as a piece of conceptual art. His uh, sculptures and his work process uh, continue to develop uh, these ideas uh, and, and to work with these verbs, so this become his way of, of addressing his process of working with sculpture. Now we arrive at uh, conceptual art. And uh, of course, concept, as you already heard from the lecture before with performance art and the work of many artists, I mentioned many times, Yoko Ono, and, uh, and also now we also could see some references even with art, within Art of Over and so, so many of these artists, and of course, when we talk about happening and fluxus, all these artists were already working conceptually. So they were already picking, picking up this idea that more importantly than the object itself was the idea or the concept behind the object. Um, so this, we can say that as a movement, conceptual art encompasses many tendencies that are uh, focused on expanding the boundaries between art uh, and, and different artistic uh, forms. And this happened in Europe, in the United States, but also in Latin America. So conceptual art can be traced all the way back to Cubism and to Dada, in the sense that um, you remember from the work of Duchamp, for example, who we could say was definitely one of the first or perhaps the first conceptual artist when he did, uh, when he worked with, with a fountain and he created this fountain with a urinal. Um, but we can also say that the Cubists were already working conceptually since they were working with collage and also assemblage. So, and there was already this, uh, this uh, focus that the idea was more important than the object uh, itself. Um, so basically conceptual art picks up this ethic, uh, aesthetic uh, ethic and, and the way of working which has reference to, to the avant-garde. Um, and the movement claims that all art is conceptual. So what's more important is, is the idea and the communication, more important than the material or the visual components. So in this case one could, one could say that minimalism in this way can be different from conceptual art since it's very focused on the object, although some minimalist artists were also interested in the concept or, or the idea. So th these things, depending on the artist and on the artwork, also because many of these movements were happening simultaneously, often the boundaries are not so, 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 so clear. And this is also, it became more and more a tendency that since these movements were happening, happening simultaneously, um, they are not so much seen as distinctions, but more as uh, positions where artists were choosing to either to direct themselves to, depending also on their own work process and, and the time and the circumstance they were working in. 
um, so conceptual art was very influenced by in this way by the simplicity of minimalism so the idea of uh, of, of working really with with what could be the essence of the idea uh, and also with the material often just the, the material in, in its more pure um, pure form or pure manifestation and conceptual artists were also very interested in working with installation and uh, in rejecting conventions for example of sculpture and painting and trying to dematerialize uh, art so often what happened with conceptual art was that there wasn't even no pr uh, production of an artistic object itself uh, and often, so for example in the case of Yoko Ono or also often in, in the case of the work of Josef Beuys who also worked uh, conceptually, uh, the instructions or the idea, the, the written uh, idea was already the artistic, the artistic object. But often many conceptual artists and in this way fluxus artists were also, can also be considered conceptual uh, artists, they created a very um, diversified out output um, of of um, of art by by using um, a mix of uh, objet trouvé assemblage, but often excuse me, computer, but often also um, bringing together integrated in the artwork performance happening and ephemeral uh, elements. So. Conceptual artists were also interested, similarly to the artists from Art Opera, in uh, critiquing art as an institution and um, also in trying to rethink the logic of the, of the art market. So criticizing aesthetics as expression and skill and also the idea of, of, uh, of, of value and of, of being able to sell the, wor the work as fundamentally in irrelevant or not so important in the artwork. And we have some examples from page 53 on of uh, work of conceptual artists. We have an example from Solvit, standing open structure black. In this case, this is a, a sculpture, which of course it's a minimalist sculpture, so reduced, uh, very reduced to very simple elements. And we have also from Zolivit a wall drawing, which was first drawn by uh, James Walker. This is the wall drawing 16. Uh, and this was an innovation by Zolivit that really articulates uh, Zolivit's belief that the conception of the idea, more importantly than the execution, is the artwork. So he really wanted to reject this um, importance of, of the artwork which is made by the hand, by the artist's own hand and so he delegated uh, someone else in this came, case James Walker to do the drawing so it's also a way for Solovit to criticize or or to address the, the practical aspect and also the the nature of drawing and how much time and effort uh, drawing can consume and in some ways it can also be interpreted as a provocative statement. Uh, also in the field of conceptual art we, we have very importantly the work of uh, Jenny Holzer who studied as a visual artist and then worked with typography and she worked with typography to create these artworks that that work with uh, phrases or with with lines, we could say, that are made to, that are created and put put into context or installed into context, and often they are made they are um, they have the intention of making us feel uncomfortable or confronting us with political ethical uh, topics. Um, so she's, she's of course a, a female artist and she was very interest, interested in addressing the relationships of power, uh, situations of abuse of power. So we have as an example on page 58, abuse of power comes as no surprise. Uh, 
and uh, her work was also extremely innovative because she used these uh, and this was in the late 70s and, and beginning 80s. She used these LED screens, which were normally used um, to, to show messages from, from news or eventually advertising, but also um, at, at, uh, at the entrance of a cinema and so on. Normally, uh, the messages we see in this, in this kind of set, uh, setting are informative so she uses this situation and, and these places to install messages which are also informative but which have a political content and often the content is unpleasant or provocative or it's meant to to make us uh, think think about topics uh, she, she was working at so namely the relations of uh, power um, also uh, topics related, of course, to, to feminism. So we have in page 59 uh, from the Jenny Holzer survival series, men don't protect you anymore. Remorse in advance is efficient. Protect me from what I want. So these messages are also made to, um, to make us think, uh, of course, to make us think critically. In this case of protect me, from what I want, uh, it's it's installed in a large large scale. So and, and in connection to a building, so very visible from the urban from the urban landscape. And um, normally we would expect some kind of an advertising, and then we have this kind of uh, message, which gives us more an idea of also using uh, using a situation which would perhaps. Uh, trigger us to, to buy something or to consume something and giving us a message which is exactly contradictory with the place where it is. So protect me from what I want. In this case, it can make us think about desires which are created by uh, artificially by pervasive advertising and so on and so on. So it's a very intelligent way to use exactly such a context to express uh, or to criticize um, to criticize this kind of um, maneuver. On page 62 you have uh, the 42nd Street uh, Art Project which was uh, installed in, um, in, a, in a cinema theater. It is in your self-interest to find a way to be very tender. So often what happened also in, the, in Jenny Holzer's uh, um, sentences was that we would have often contradictory uh, or paradoxical statements. Uh, we would find uh, statements which would encourage us to be emotional and sensitive and vulnerable, but being in a context that we are not sure if it's meant ironically or not. So I think that often uh, Jenny Holzer wanted us to, to confront with our own feelings about how, how we see and how we feel about it. And we have on page 63, installation at the Guggenheim, um, also ta taking huge of, of taking advantage of this space with a, with a, with a spiral. Um, Parkour and, and installing these LED signs, which completely transform the space and give it almost an arcade uh, arcade feeling. So also a completely different interpretation of, of what the space can work with and, and changing the space by um, with, with the installation. Uh, another tendency. Uh, that developed also uh, was uh, post-minimalism and of course post-minimalism appeared as a reaction to minimalism logically um, and it was also something that happened it didn't happen after minimalism and this is what's also interesting about about the second wave of the avant-garde of the 20th century was that many of these movements happened simultaneously. So it was not only that one movement such as minimalist, minimalism 
exhausted itself and saw another uh, opposing movement appear. Often these were trends that were happening uh, sim simultaneously and eventually even with overlaps. But in the case of uh, post-minimalism, uh, this movement really collects a kind of reactions that, that were of, of artists that were not interested in the austerity and formalism of the minimalist style. They were not interested in abstraction, so they were very, very, they were not working with a pure geometric form, and they were much more interested in working with processes. So, um, there were already artists before that were very interested in working with the idea of process, and we saw, we saw this over in informal art, uh, in painting, and we could also say that we saw it with, uh, with Jackson Pollock, uh, but we saw it especially uh, in Fluxus uh, and with the work of Josef Beuys, which was absolutely focused on process and on transformation processes. So post-minimalism also has some connections to uh, land art. For example, one of the artists who was very interested in post-minimalism or, or developed this, uh, these ideas of, of post-minimalism was Robert Smithson, uh, and he is mostly known also for his work in uh, or with uh, land art. So, what post-minimalist uh, artists wanted to do was really um, to push further these ideas of uh, process artists and uh, really focus, focus the, the, the interest in the materiality of, of sculpture, for example. And they worked by developing, developing also large-scale uh, works. So they were very interested also in, in um, in working with materials that could have uh, take advantage, advantage of a lot of space and often outside of the gallery, uh, in, for example, in the case of Robert uh, Smithson, but in the case, for example, of uh, Eva Hesse, who had a very uh, short short career because she died when, when she was in her mid uh, 30s. Uh, she was also, in the case of uh, Eva Hesse, she was specifically interested in working with unconventional materials and materials that uh, had absolutely no connection with industry and that expressed uh, or uh, more warmth, organic, and sometimes even um, uncanny or, or um, materials that would make us aware of our own body and our own organicity. So, so materials that would not necessarily be considered very beautiful, but would have more of this organic process, processual um, quality. Um, so some feminist artists, for example, uh, Eva Hesse, also wanted to work, especially in the realm of, of sculpture and installation, wanted to work in this post-minimalism way, in a way to reintroduce qualities of emotional expression, which were definitely not uh, an aspect which was addressed with uh, minimalism, that was really interested in abstraction and materiality. Uh, so we can see from page 66 on, we, we have some examples from the work of uh, Eva Hesse, and we have Hangout, Metronomic Irregularity, Untitled or Not Yet, Addendum, and we see that in Eva Hesse's uh, work we really have uh, this very delicate balance between uh, simple informal uh, materials with very organic uh, uh, character. Often the shape is not, not very clear. Uh, but also at the same time, often uh, some allusions to, to the human body and also to sexuality. Um, Eva Hesse, she, she herself had, uh, she had uh, health difficulties, so, so, so she lived uh, for many years with emotional and, and health uh, difficulties and often this kind of idea of, of vulnerability and of fragility of, of the human body is expressed in her um, in her uh, sculptures. <laughs> 
Um, on page 76 we have the work of Robert uh, Smithson, uh, Spiral Jetty. And this was a, this is a land art piece which was uh, installed in Salt Lake City in Utah in the United States and it's from 1970. Uh, and uh, this is already in the direction of land art and we see that there is definitely in the case of Robert Smithson this idea of, of making an intervention in the landscape which, um, which is of course human or man-made but at the same time in allusion to organic processes and to, to the forms and processes of nature, nature itself. We will talk about land art a little bit in a little bit more detail uh, next, but this already makes the transition. Uh, so in the work of Robert Smithson, we, we have uh, also in the context of gallery installations, he worked a lot with sculpture and installation, um, the, this uh, contrast and, and integration of uh, natural materials, so for example rocks, uh, and, and mirrors to create a spatial situation. We have the same situation or, or similar situation on page uh, 78, mirror and crushed shells from 1969, and also later work more in the direction of uh, land art so from 1971, broken circle or spiral hill. So we see from the work of Robert Smithson that he was very interested in this contrast between the natural processes, so uh, recreating or, or, or uh, analyzing the process, natural process, organic processes themselves, and then inter interfering or intervening with sculptural elements, mirrors uh, very often, to see how this uh, human intervention in, in, in direct contact with nature and, and to use this to create the artwork. Also on page 81 we have the partially buried uh, wood shell, woodshed, uh, in which we see a wood shell, woodshed partially uh, buried uh, on earth and of course this is also processual in the way that we can uh, we can see that and in this way it can also be interpreted as a still life. We have a building which is partially buried and we can see uh, this idea of, of the building being uh, absorbed into nature and potentially left there to, to decay and to be and, and to be consumed since uh, it, it is made of uh, natural materials. But we have at the same time this contrast between the natural and the man-made or the human-made. One of uh, Robert Smithson's major earthworks, so works that, that, that worked with earth, was designed to exist outside and it's called Asphalt Rundown and it's a, a demonstration of what Smithson called the crystalline structure of time and then his idea, uh, the idea was that time does not pass so much as it builds upon itself. Uh, asphalt Rundown was installed in a quarry outside of Rome and Smithson poured a truckload of hot asphalt down a steep embankment which cooled and hardened as it fell. The resulting sculpture can be seen as time frozen, mid-flow or as yet another sedimentary layer in the infinite accumulation of time. So this piece is a meditation on time but it's also a meditation between uh, between the intervention of of the of of the human in the environment and in this case by pouring asphalt directly on on the quarry and of course we can uh, agree or disagree with this artistic gesture as a as a sculpture um, but of course it has it has this processual processual uh, quality and and a, 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 uh, sculptural quality also. Uh, so I stopped post-minimalism with the work of Robert Smithson exactly because we arrive now at land art and 
with land art, we pick up Robert Smithson again. Um, and and of course we can also see that in the case in the case of uh, Robert Smithson, um, this idea of working with the asphalt, of course, it's to bring awareness of uh, through the sculpture of what this gesture of of pouring the asphalt in the earth and the implications this has in terms of of the action of the human of the human in the environment. So land art, sometimes also called earth art really uh, originated also in the 70s and is also very connected uh, to performance art and to conceptual art and, and sometimes also to, to minimalism uh, and land art really originated with the rise of, um, of an environmental awareness and uh, was very influenced by ideas of postmodernism. So the movement uh, introduced in art the idea of working site specifically so producing an artwork which is made specifically for a site uh, by using natural spaces and materials natural materials uh, and these could be the soil so earth water gravel or stone um, we could see also already in the work of Robert Smithson that some land artists were interested in picking up these um, references from prehistoric artwork. So for example, the, the stone arrangements from Stonehenge uh, were, were inspirational, but also marks in Whitfield. So when you saw, you could see in the work of, of uh, Robert Smithson this motive of the spiral, for example. And the idea was to try to do again something that, that would reconnect to, to a more archaic and respectful uh, relationship between the human and, and nature. So often, um, because also being very interested in processes and in organic processes, pieces of land art were very ephemeral in character. So in this way, one could see some connections with, with the idea of, of uh, still life, because also the materials used were often also very perishable or, or, or often uh, the interventions didn't even last long in the landscape. And, and this coincidentally was something that was used by Richard Long. Who, who did some uh, pieces that, that were really ephemeral, that, that, that were um, carved in the landscape, for example, just with his uh, steps. And uh, we have here a line on page 85, a line made by walking by Richard Long in 1967. And Richard Long integrated this idea of working as uh, with land art, also as a performance artist. So in this case, the artwork, is uh, is the result of an action in the landscape which is only preserved because there is a photographic record and this is the only trace of the artwork that exists so of course in this case um, it's also a critique to, to the value of art and to the marketability 